The Royal Society is Britain's National Academy of Science and exists to recognise, promote and support excellent science. At Royal Society Publishing, we see our role as validating and curating the scientific record to make it as reliable as possible for others to build on. In 1665, we launched the world's first science journal. And since then, we have published some of the most eminent researchers in history and some of the most important scientific discoveries. Today, our 10 journals continue to publish high quality content across the full range of science. We would love you to submit to our journals and we can offer you a high quality peer review, we can offer you rapid decision times, we work closely with our authors to maximise the publicity and impact of their work. At the Royal Society we want to encourage the most exciting and innovative new science. We want to find the next Rosalind Franklin and Isaac Newton and we strongly encourage you to submit your work to Royal Society journals. Okay, welcome everybody to the next webinar in the AAPA webinar series. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. First, uh, we're going to be doing questions at the end today after all the presentations, but please don't hesitate to type your question in as it occurs to you. So you can ask your questions by going to the questions box on your GoToWebinar control panel and you just type it in. If you don't want me to announce your name when I read the question, just type Anon or Anonymous or something like that at the beginning, and I'll just read the question without reading your name. Um, one more item, we want to thank the Royal Society Publishing for being our sponsor today. If you'd like to be a sponsor, just reach out to us. We would very much uh, be interested in talking to you about that. Uh, but we have the Royal Society as our title sponsor today. And we'll be seeing a short one minute video from them later in the in the webinar. So thank you again to them. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jinjun. Thank you, Brett. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the AAPA month, uh, monthly webinar series. Uh, my name is Jinjun Zhang, and I'm the organizer for today's event. Before we start today, I'd first like to thank the AAPA, the Burke Association, and also the Royal Society Publishing for providing us with this great opportunity and sponsoring our events, uh, which is particularly meaningful for this very challenging year. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you, um, including our guest speakers and also our audience from all over the world to join us today. We know that the fast development of genomics and the computational biology have dramatically changed the horizon of anthropological studies over the last decade. Uh, we were able to study human evolution from completely novel angles, um, but the methods used in the genomics and computational biology may still remain challenging to understand for a lot of folks. So today, we have the honor to invite four brilliant scientists to discuss their research in different um, populations around the world, as well as the methods used in their studies. So first of all, um, let's welcome Dr. Catherine Kroons from Duke University to talk about her study of genetic variation and demographic influence in Cabo Verdes. Uh, welcome, Catherine. The stage is yours. Thank you. Um, let me just pull up my slides. Thank you so much for organizing and for having me. All right. So today I'm going to talk about some of our recent work using population genetics to understand recent history in the human population of Cabo Verde. This is work that I've done as a postdoc in Amy Goldberg's lab, together in collaboration with Sandra Beleza. I want to begin by pointing out how much genetics has taught us about the movement of people throughout human history. Here is just a snapshot of some major human migrations as they were drawn in a review article on the genomic insights into human migration routes. Now we are constantly revising and adding to our picture of population movement in human history, but we know the genetic exchange between previously separated groups has been a constant feature both globally and throughout time in human evolution. At the genetic level, the combination of previously isolated populations can lead to a new admix gene pool, such as these orange and blue haplotypes or blocks of genetic material from different source populations coming together here to form a combined gene pool. 
From this combined gene pool, generations of recombination can lead to the shuffling of these orange and blue genetic backgrounds. So we end up with an admix population where individuals have these blocks of different ancestries. And this has a number of really important evolutionary consequences. For one, we may get new combinations of genetic variants that didn't exist in the source populations. And these combinations of alleles can be important for phenotypic variation. And from a demographic perspective, they can tell us a lot about population history, but only if we know how to interpret them. I also want to point out that unlike these plain orange and blue source populations, we also have all this additional information from ancestry patterns. In classical population genetics, we tend to think about measurements that track allele frequencies, but these can take a while to change and can be biased for a variety of reasons. We're going to talk about how these blocks of ancestry from different sources can tell us what's happening in populations, especially on very short time scales. All of these genetic patterns offer a line of evidence about population history, which is especially valuable in populations where we don't have a lot of historical records or for populations that have been underrepresented or excluded. But we first need to know how well our genomic methods work for telling us about population history. And there haven't been that many comparisons between historical records and genetics-based inferences. And that particular gap is one of the reasons we're interested in case studies where we can calibrate some of our expectations about how population genetics reflects historical and social processes, especially on short time scales. So under that goal, today I'm going to share some of our recent work looking at the population genetics of Cabo Verde. Cabo Verde is this cluster of islands off the coast of West Africa. And these islands were uninhabited until very recently, when they were founded starting in the late 1400s. So that was only 20 to 25 generations ago. And the islands were populated by Portuguese colonizers and enslaved West African people who founded the islands in a serial stepping stone-like fashion, beginning with the island of Santiago here, shortly after the island of Fogo, and then later waves of already admixed individuals moved to the northern islands, Boa Vista, and what I'll refer to as the Northwest Cluster. And importantly, all of this is really well documented, giving us a lot of opportunity to see where our inferences break down when we try to infer population history. And that's exactly what we're doing using genome-wide SNP data from 563 Cabo Verdean individuals with the sample sizes from each island shown here. And we'll also draw in data from African and European populations that serve as proxies or reference populations for the source populations that contributed to the admixture in Cabo Verde. Now, when we think about common ways we try to learn about population history from genetic data, we often think about trying to infer the timing of major events, such as the timing of admixture. So I want to show you what happens when we try to infer admixture timing in Cabo Verde. First, let's start with our historical estimates. So here we have the known settlement time for the four regions we're looking at in number of generations leading up until the present. We know that founding started with Santiago, then Fogo, and then the Northern Islands. And we have a range of timing for these historical estimates because we've translated a date or a handful of dates from the historical records to a 20 to 30 year generation time. And I wanna emphasize that the islands were uninhabited prior to founding in the 1400s. So the timing of admixture is clear and we have a lot of historical records to draw from. Now, there are a variety of genetic methods to estimate admixture timing that use the logic that recombination can be leveraged as a sort of clock. Meaning that if we go back to our schematic of admixture here, since recombination shuffles haplotypes over generations, the lengths of these tracks and the linkage between alleles tells us about how long ago admixture began. Now, if we apply two common methods for inferring admixture timing from genetics, in this case, I'll show you the programs MultiWaver and Alder, we notice two interesting things about the inferred timing of admixture. First, we see similar estimates across the islands. 
despite the staggered settlement timing, which makes sense when we consider this together with the historical records of the serial founding process. So already admixed individuals from Santiago were moving to these later founded islands. But what has really stood out to us here is that all of these inferred estimates are much more recent than history tells us. And we wanted to understand why this underestimation is happening. In what ways does Cabo Verde's population history violate the assumptions that these methods use? We began by looking at identical by descent DNA tracks. So when two individuals share identical by descent or IBD DNA, that suggests common ancestors. Here within each island, we have a cluster of individuals where the spread of dots represents the degree of IBD sharing. So greater spread is due to less relatedness, such as the spread you see here in Santiago relative to the Northwest cluster. And we've drawn lines where pairs of individuals share more than 150 centimorgans of IBD. So you can see here there are more floating unconnected points in Santiago versus comparatively less relatedness or more relatedness in the Northwest cluster. And all the structure that you see here, the more edges within islands versus between islands, goes to show that DNA isn't just getting shuffled randomly throughout the whole population. And this can be driven by a variety of social processes, like mating patterns that can keep more similar haplotypes together. And in fact, we know that humans don't tend to mate randomly. We know from many studies that non-random mating can be driven by a number of factors, like geography, things like who's nearby, culture, things like who speaks the same language or shares the same customs, and phenotypic preferences, things like height or skin color. And in other admix populations, we've seen the specific type of non-random mating, ancestry-based assortative mating or ancestry-associated assortative mating. And this is where mating is structured by any number of phenotypes and behaviors that are associated with ancestry. So like skin and eye pigmentation or language. And that can lead to a positive correlation in ancestries between individuals in mating pairs. So we asked whether we can detect this type of non-random mating using our genetic data. To do that, we inferred the parental ancestries of individuals in Cabo Verde. We applied this method, Ancestor, that takes blocks of ancestry in an individual and tries to infer the likely genomic ancestries of the two parents that preceded that individual. And those two inferred parental ancestries are what I've plotted here on the X and Y axes, the proportion of African ancestry in the two parents. So each dot here is an individual and its position on the X and Y axis represents the likely African ancestry proportions of that individual's parents. So within each island, we get a positive correlation of these inferred ancestries with a mean correlation of about 0.35. So inferred parental ancestries suggest positive assortative mating throughout Cabo Verde, and this is going to be really important for our goal of inferring population history because so many population genetic methods assume random mating. Now, given our evidence of non-random mating, I want to circle back to how we approach timing inference. Here's the same plot that I showed you before with our estimates from Multiwaver and Alder but we're gonna add a new strategy that uses the non-random inheritance of ancestry at positions, or LAD for short. So we're tracking combinations of ancestry rather than the inheritance of alleles. This method accepts a non-random mating parameter, and we tried running it both with and without allowing assortative mating. So the dark green results here show the LAD results under completely random mating, and the light green here shows LED results incorporating the estimates of assortative mating strength that I obtained with those inferred parental ancestries that I showed a moment ago. So we found that accounting for assortative mating gets us much closer to these historical estimates. Not perfect, so we're obviously not accounting for everything going on in the population, but we've obtained estimates that are much closer and even overlap with these historical estimates. And this makes sense given what we know about 
how non-random mating often operates in human populations. Assortative mating can keep similar haplotypes together and thus make admixture look more recent than it actually is. All right, so now I wanna take a few minutes to discuss some of the consequences of non-random mating, not just for demographic inference, but for the landscape of genetic variation in populations. For this, let's consider ROH, or runs of homozygosity. If you look at these two example haplotypes here, ROH are just these tracks of homozygous genotypes. And these tracks reflect population history in really interesting ways. And they're very important for understanding things like disease risk, since the landscape of ROH shapes when deleterious alleles are going to be found in a homozygous state. So ROH occur when identical haplotypes are inherited from common ancestors. And this becomes really interesting when you think about when in time these ancestors occurred. Longer blocks are gonna come from recent common ancestors, while shorter haplotypes have been broken up more by recombination and usually came from more distant common ancestors. So let's take a look at the island-specific distributions of these different lengths of ROH in Cabo Verde. I inferred ROH with garlic, which considers the population-specific distributions of ROH, and Ben's identified ROH into length classes. So I'll show you separate results for shorter versus longer ROH, since these classes reflect processes at different timescales. First, here are the distributions of just the shorter ROH. So we're not looking at the longer ones yet. And if we sum up all the short ROH per genome, here are the distributions for the African and European reference populations. And you can see that African individuals have really low levels of short ROH compared to European reference populations. And African populations are the sort of canonical example of low ROH among populations globally. But interestingly, we found that the admixed individuals of Cabo Verde also have very low ROH. Some of these individuals have even less short ROH than African reference populations. And this really highlights the ability of admixture to break up ROH from these older pre-admixture ancestors. And I find this very interesting as it highlights this whole class of populations, these recently admixed populations where ROH dynamics are not really appreciated yet. Now, on the other hand, when we look at long ROH, we see this enrichment, these long tails, where some individuals have had very recent common ancestors, reflecting post-admixture population dynamics like the serial founding we talked about or the non-random mating we saw. So overall, these distinct classes of ROH capture insights from different timescales in Cabo Verde's history, reflecting the contributions of the different source populations, coming together under admixture and post-admixture dynamics like mating patterns. Now, the last piece of the story that I'll end with today is that ancestry can also tell us about how male and female demographic histories differ. First, let's take a look at African ancestry proportions on the autosomes compared to the X chromosome. So we have African ancestry proportion on the X axis, and we see a higher distribution within the population of Cabo Verde of African ancestry on the X compared to the autosomes. Since there are two copies of the X in females and one copy in males, this is often interpreted as a cue that admixture may be sex biased based on the much higher African ancestry on the X versus the autosomes. But how does this translate to the contributions of the source populations? Using these observations of ancestry proportions and the number of males versus females in the sample, we applied a mechanistic model of admixture that allows for constant rather than single pulse admixture. And we can compare admixture estimates from our data to the mean admixture across individuals produced under the mechanistic model. So then we compute the Euclidean distance between the model predictions and the observations, and we keep the parameters that explain the data the best, which I'll show you here. 
So we found that plotting the proportion of the estimated contributions to Cabo Verde from females, almost all of the African contributions are from females. And this is consistent with social dynamics associated with slavery, and our findings underscore how both the genetics, genetic impacts of the slave trade and show how we can use genetics to understand the histories of forcibly displaced populations where records are often absent or biased. Now, to leave you with a few last thoughts, we found that both population history and social processes have important genetic consequences. Specifically, in this case study of Cabo Verde, we've seen that sex bias migration and non-random mating have consequences even in the very short 20 generation timescale since founding. And we saw how this population provides a really clear example of how mating patterns can bias demographic inference if we don't take those population dynamics into account. We also saw how distinct classes of ROH reflect different aspects of population history, which is really important for understanding the exposure of deleterious variation especially in recently admixed populations where we haven't had as many opportunities to investigate these dynamics. More generally, these insights from Cabo Verde have been an opportunity to think about how we approach interpreting genetic data in populations where we don't have the same historical documentation to sort of ground us and check our inferences. And I also wanna quickly plug that we're planning to post this work to BioArchive in the next few weeks. So please stay tuned and we would love to hear any feedback. And with that, I would like to thank you all for listening and I wanna acknowledge both the Goldberg Lab and our collaborators on this work. I'm happy to take questions e either during the question session or afterwards. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Catherine, for this fantastic presentation. Uh, next, we have Dr. Shemalika Gopalan, also from Duke University, to talk about the genetics and demographic history in Southwest Ethiopia. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry that my uh, webcam does not seem to be working, but hopefully this will work just fine without it. Um, okay, great. So. Hi, as I mentioned, my name is Shamalika Gopalan. Um, today I'm going to be talking about my work inferring the genetic relationships and demographic history of populations in Southwest Ethiopia. So in this work, um, which I conducted as a PhD student in Brennan's lab at Stony Brook University, um, we investigated a recent agricultural transition by studying uh, extant populations. So for a very brief background, um, all human societies were originally based on hunting and gathering as a subsistence strategy, but today the vast majority of people and societies around the world um, are agriculturalists. And this happened because starting about 10,000 years ago, people began transitioning from hunting and gathering to agriculture. And it's been hotly debated whether this occurred primarily through a demographic replacement um, or uh, through cultural adoption of agricultural practices by hunter-gatherers. So we focused on Southwest Ethiopia, a region of the world where this transition began relatively late and is currently ongoing. And it's home to some of the few remaining hunter-gatherer populations in the world. So studying this process, um, so additionally studying this process from an archeological standpoint is quite challenging because the record is uh, very poor. So we focused on the Chabu, a group of traditionally um, hunting and gathering people um, however, they have been transitioning rapidly away from this mode of subsistence in the past few decades. They speak a language that has been quite controversial to classify, but is currently thought to be a linguistic isolate. We also uh, genotyped the Chabu's nearest neighbors, the Majang and the Shikacho. So the Majang are a Nile Saharan speaking group who practice small scale shift, uh, shifting cultivation, um, as well as hunting and foraging. And they also have other features of hunter-gatherer societies, such as being highly egalitarian and mobile. The Shikacho, um, on the other hand, are an Afro-Asiatic speaking group who practice intensive cultivation. We also collected samples from two additional populations, the nearby Bench and Sheko, 
um, who are also Afroasiatic speakers practicing cultivation. So we're interested in understanding the genetic relationship between the Chabu, the uh, transitioning hunter-gatherers, and the other populations in the region. So for fuller context, we also combine genotype data that um, so we combine the genotype data that we generated, indicated in the uh, yellow dots here, with published data from Uganda, the DRC, Kenya, Sudan, and South Sudan. So this gave us good representation of Nilo-Saharan and Afroasiatic speaking groups across Eastern Africa. And we additionally included the Yoruba of Nigeria and Palestinians to capture additional ancestral components associated with um, known Neolithic migrations across Africa. And finally, I was able to include data from a single ancient individual as well, Mota, who lived quite close to our uh, region and populations of interest um, and lived uh, about 4,500 years ago, which is well before any archaeological evidence for pastoralism or intensive cultivation in this region. So the first thing that I did was to estimate the global ancestry proportions for all of the individuals in this data set using admixture analysis. So um, if you haven't seen these type of plots before, so each individual here is represented by a vertical bar and they're modeled as a combination of, in this case, five putative ancestries, each um, represented by a different color. So this data set uh, comprised 117,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms and um, included 871 individuals across these 43 groups. So when we break it down, um, so the patterns that we see in this analysis is that genetic structure of these populations broadly follows linguistic lines with very few exceptions. So the Nile Saharan speaking groups um, labeled green here on the left tend to be characterized by a high proportion of green ancestry while the Afroasiatic speaking populations labeled here in purple tend to be characterized by high proportions of purple ancestry. And this is the general group that the Shikacho, who we genotyped for the study, um, fall into. Um, and perhaps more interesting is this pattern of blue ancestry, which characterizes the Sheko, the Bench, the Chabu, and the Majan, who are the other populations that we genotyped. So this blue component defines Mota, um, plotted over here on the left, the 4,500 year old ancient individual who carries the highest proportion of this ancestry um, of any of the individuals in this data set. And this blue ancestry also connects these populations to two occupational groups of Ari. Um, these are the Ari cultivators who are farmers and the Ari blacksmiths who are iron and woodworkers. Um, the Gamus exhibit a similar profile, uh, more similar to the Chabu and the Majang, really with the substantial portions of Nile Saharan ancestry. Um, and they actually live in a distinct uh, administrative zone in Northwest Ethiopia. Um, like the Majang though, they practice small scale cultivation and have some of these cultural features of hunter-gatherer societies. And like the Chabu, they speak what is thought to be a linguistic isolate. So looking at this component geographically also reveals um, that this blue ancestry, which characterizes the ancient sample Mota, today is found at uh, its highest frequencies in Southwest Ethiopia, in the Chabu, Bench, Sheko, and Ari populations. So again, to emphasize, this analysis shows that these populations, the Chabu, Majang, Gamuz, Bench, and Sheko, have strong genetic connections to this um, ancient individual that lived prior to any evidence of intensive agriculture or pastoralism. Um, and this demonstrates that this ancestral component has been present in Southwest Ethiopia for at least the last 5, 000, or, sorry, 4,500 years. Um, and currently it's uh, most frequent in Southwest Ethiopia, um, although it's also represented in the Gamuz of Northwest Ethiopia. So the conclusions of this analysis bring us back to the main question. So what happened to these hunting and gathering groups? Um, did they largely go extinct? Did they largely become absorbed into incoming agriculturalist populations? Did they shift culturally or did they persist? So in order to get at the answers to these questions, um, the next thing that we tried to do was to infer past demographic changes in Southwest Ethiopian groups. So we relied on a method called IBDNE published in 2015 by Sharon and Brian Browning. 
Um, and this relies on patterns of identity by descent to infer past effective population sizes. Um, so effective population size, uh, I've abbreviated here NE, is distinct from census size, um, census size being the total number of individuals belonging to a population. Um, NE rather is, uh, represents the number of individuals that a modeled or idealized version of the population would have in order to exhibit the same genetic features of that population. So again, the method relies on patterns of identity by descent or IBD, and these are stretches of the genome that are identical between people because of shared ancestry. So in this figure, the two individuals at the very bottom here show the small um, boxed out region of their genome, IBD, um, because they inherit it from their common great grandparent and uh, from this orange sequence here. Um, going back through the generations then, these share segments become longer and longer the closer the pair of individuals is to the, their common ancestor. Um, and in general, the more individuals contributing to the population, um, the less IBD sharing there will be among pairs. So by looking at the length of IBD segments across a population and by accounting for recombination rate across the genome, this method, IBDNE, can generate an estimate of what the effective population size was at various time points in the past. So we applied this method to each of the Southwest Ethiopian populations, and I'm just gonna step through the results that we got now. So in all of these uh, subsequent plots, um, just note that the estimate of NE is on the y-axis, and the number of generations ago is on the x-axis. So in this case, we're going backwards in time from left to right. Um, the dotted line is comprised of the point estimates at any given generation that IBD, IBDNE generates, and the colored ribbon represents the 95% bootstrapped confidence intervals. So the first thing that we found then is that the Chabu, the transitioning hunter-gatherers, show evidence of a decline in NE appearing to start about 40 generations ago. Um, similarly to the Chabu, the Majang also show a decline in effective population size, again starting about 40 generations ago. However, the Gamus, who have a similar genetic profile to the Majang and to the Chabu to some extent, appear to be increasing over the same time period. We also observe um, opposing trajectories in the Aria blacksmiths and the Aria cultivators uh, who are known to have diverged very recently within the last 4,500 years. The bench and the Sheko are also declining overall, but they show this very large inflation in NE at about 35 generations ago, especially for the bench. And note again here on the y-axis, the scale here is uh, very different than in the previous plots and it goes up to 100,000. So what I find interesting about these results is that we see evidence for significant heterogeneity in the pattern of historical ME across these populations, all of which, um, as I mentioned before, share this strong genetic uh, connection to the ancient individual MOTA. Um, and more specifically, we see divergent um, opposing demographic trends in closely related populations. And finally, when we apply this method to the Shikacho and Walita, um, Afroasiatic speaking cultivator groups who neighbor the Chabu and Ari populations respectively, we see a huge overall increase in the effective population size towards the present. And again, um, to draw your attention to the y-axis here, it's actually on a log scale in this case, so this is very uh, dramatic population growth. And this does fit in with previous work looking at the demographic trajectories of farming populations throughout the world which do find these um, recent exponential increases in NE um, yeah, through it, within these farming populations. So we can say that this method, IBDNE, gives us insight into the recent demographic changes in Southwest Ethiopia using the genetics of extant populations. Um, however, we did have two concerns about interpreting the output of this method on our data set um, related to the assumptions and the uh, the, the uses of this method. So the first was our limited sample size. So for each of these populations, we had only between 17 and 83 individuals. Um, secondly, was the possibility of recent gene flow. So um, gene flow occurring within the same time window as we are trying to estimate NE. And this is a scenario that this version of IBDNE cannot account for. 
Um, and so given the nature of our questions and of our data set, we were interested in um, investigating further both of these possible issues. Um, and so in order to do this, we performed demographic simulations using MS Prime, uh, which is a program that's implemented in Python and allows you to generate genetic data under demographic scenarios that the user specifies. And then we uh, applied our any estimation pipeline to the simulated data. So the first scenario I'm going to talk through is showing a tenfold population decline beginning 50 generations ago. So again, to orient you, the, um, the simulated NE, the, the true case, is plotted here in the red dashed lines, and the black dots um, represent the point estimates that IBDNE has come up with. Um, and the gray ribbons, again, are the 95% confidence intervals. So here in this declining case, I sampled 20, 50, and 100 individuals from the population and estimated their NE uh, again, between four and 60 generations ago, same time span as the real data results I showed before. And we find that um, a decline of this magnitude could be accurately estimated with only 20 individuals. However, if you have more individuals, that's obviously better and allows IBDNE to more precisely recover more ancient um, estimates of NE with uh, the narrower confidence intervals. So next, we looked at the effective sample size when there's no NE change at all over time. So here it's fixed uh, at 5,000. And here we do see qualitative differences between the true demographic history and what was inferred by IBDNE. At the lowest sample size of 20, the method does infer spurious fluctuation in population size and in the end infers an increase, which is obviously not real. Um, we found that this was mitigated by the inclusion of more samples. So if we have 50 samples, um, it gets a little bit better. We largely uh, recover the true demographic history. And with 100 samples, obviously, that's a bit better. Uh, finally, when the population size is increasing, we're able to recover the signal with, uh, again, relatively few individuals. And at the smallest sample size, again, there's a little bit of spurious fluctuation, and the final NE is overestimated. But with 50 individuals, our NE estimate is actually quite accurate and precise. So when returning back to our real data results, um, our simulations have shown us that if you have at least 50 individuals, you can be reasonably confident in the um, demographic trajectories that IBDNE infers. However, with much less than 50 individuals, we should keep in mind that recent apparent increases or fluctuations might not be real. So um, I'm just going to look again at the populations with the lowest sample sizes. So given our simulation results, um, we can actually be reasonably confident that the RE Blacksmiths have experienced a significant population decline, despite the fact that we only have 17 samples from this population. For the RE cultivators, however, because they're estimated to have increased uh, slightly, about threefold, and we only have 24 samples, we might be a little bit more circumspect about um, this specific uh, estimate. Finally, though, for the Woleta, they also have a small sample size, about 35 um, individuals. But in this case, it is likely that they are truly increasing, um, simply because of the magnitude of the change in this case. So from the simulations, um, we saw that a spurious increase only amounted to about a two-fold change, whereas in this case, obviously, it's much more than that as the growth is exponential. So the second factor that we considered um, that we considered might affect IBDNE's estimates is gene flow, which I mentioned before, um, this version is not designed to account for. And as you may have noticed, um, almost all of the, all of the individuals uh, here are modeled as a combination of two or more distinct ancestries. So we performed formal tests of admixture for these groups and estimated the timing of these um, events and found evidence for recent gene flow in some of these populations. We sought to understand how the timing and amount of gene flow might affect um, NE estimates, again, using simulations. So here uh, we performed, again, simulations with a steady population of 5,000, but we also um, introduced a pulse of gene flow of 10% uh, 
for my diverged population at either 20, 30, 40, or 50 generations ago. So with the sample size of 20, we see that the effect of this is to inflate the NE estimate at or just prior to the occurrence of gene flow. Um, but also, the further back in time this admixture occurred, the less it biased the NE estimate overall. When we increase the sample size from 20 to 50, this appears to, again, significantly mitigate this bias, and we see only a slight inflation in NE prior to the gene flow event. However, if we turn this dial up on gene flow and consider an admixture proportion of 50%, the bias on NE um, again becomes problematic. So here, even with a sample size of 50, um, with the 50% admixture scenario, we see a significant degree of spurious inflation um, in the estimate prior to the gene flow event. So putting this all together, we can see that we can say that gene flow tends to create an inflation in NE at or just prior to the gene flow event. Um, if the degree of gene flow is modest, so for example, in our case, 10%, the bias introduced can be corrected for somewhat by in increasing the sample size. However, if it's, um, if it's more extreme, for example, the 50-50 admixture case, and if it's recent, any estimates can be quite off, um, and increasing the sample size to the same degree doesn't seem to fix this. So again, to revisit some of our uh, real data, we conducted F3-based formal tests of admixture and dated these events using ALDER, and we identified strong evidence for recent, uh, relatively recent gene flow in the Sheko, Bench, Shikacho, and Woleta. So in our range of estimates for the timing of gene flow uh, for the Bench and the Sheko, they overlap considerably, and they begin around 42 generations ago. For the Shikacho, it ranges between three and 10 generations ago, and for the Waleta, between 35 and 47 generations ago. So given what we learned from our simulations, um, we should probably be a bit skeptical of the really large bumps in NE in the history of these populations. However, the overall trends, both the declines and the increases, are likely true. And this is something that we also looked at with additional simulations, and we found that that was supported. So the point of all of this is not to say that IBD is not useful. In fact, um, I think it's very useful. It's a very useful tool that we can use for inferring um, past effective population size and addressing questions that we might be interested in in anthropological genetics. However, it does um, emphasize that puzzling demographic trends, such as um, in the bench, which show this massive increase of 50,000 followed by a massive population crash, crash um, should be considered more critically. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that demographic events such as gene flow can introduce these unusual patterns of IBD that violate the methods assumptions. Um, and I want to emphasize again that the results that we get are not total nonsense. And that overall, we can get a good sense of which populations are declining and which are not. And that's ultimately what is important for the goals of our work. And so returning back to those, um, our main findings uh, our, our analyses show that these formerly hunting and gathering groups were impacted quite differently by the migration um, of pastoralists and agriculturalists throughout Southwest Ethiopia. Most of these declined, um, including the Chabu, the Majong, the Ari blacksmiths, following the global trend for hunter-gatherer populations. However, others um, at least held steady or increased, and those include the Gamuz and the Ari cultivators. What is left unresolved um, are the reasons for this heterogeneity. So this might relate to differences, um, just individual differences in population and how they uh, responded to the expansion of agriculture and pastoralism in this region. So what's needed now is continued anthropological and archeological work that can help shed some light on this. So I'm gonna finish now with some acknowledgement. So foremost, um, I acknowledge the uh, Chabu, Ben, Sheko, Shikacho, and Majang people, who we thank for contributing to this work. Um, and I'd like to thank also all of my co-authors on the uh, paper. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nami. This is a great presentation. Um, next, we have Dr. Torsten Gunter from the Uppsala University in Sweden. And he will talk about um, the archaeological findings in one of the early uh, Islamic burial in the Levant. 
Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much um, for having me. Uh, good evening from Sweden. I think this might be one of the few upsides of this year is that I can contribute to this uh, webinar from Sweden without uh, traveling for one day, one way. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. What I want to present today is a project that kind of started off as a, uh, as a small side project, but that became bigger and bigger beyond the just the analysis of genomic data by um, by input, by additional information, additional type of data that we got along the way from, um, from other directions and from other disciplines. Uh, I want to take you to the um, region of modern day Syria in, um, in the Levant. More specifically, I want to take you to an archeological site called Tel Kasa, uh, which is in the south of Syria. So um, um, around, uh, around here in the south of, south of Syria, close to Jordan, close to, uh, close to Israel and Lebanon. And that archeological site um, actually is um, a very rich site with a very long archeological record going back um, to the pre-pottery Neolithic, so really the first people that, uh, that practiced farming in the, uh, in the Levant, and then stretching over similar, several different time periods and several uh, millennia um, into the, from the Neolithic into the Calcolithic, the Bronze Age and Iron Age. So you really find um, different parts of the site um, being used at different, uh, during different time periods. And um, that is also the, uh, generally the most, uh, the time period that most of the team that worked on this initially is interested in. Um, when we started this project, we thought that this would be a project about uh, the Neolithic time period. So that was um, that was what the people were interested in when the excavations were, were conducted, and that's also what uh, what most of um, other collaborators, including us geneticists, um, are usually working on. Um, but before I go into go into the results, just a quick introduction, and I, it might also be a good introduction for Melinda's talk late, later on um, about the general workflow, what we do in archaeogenomic research. Uh, so we usually start with uh, with human remain from such an archaeological excavation, so a bone or a tooth, which we uh, which we then the next step take to our ancient DNA lab, so a clean lab where we want to avoid uh, contamination, modern human contamination especially. Uh, we extract the DNA and build a sequencing library. We put that onto um, one of these big sequencing machines, uh, which then after a couple of hours or a couple of days of running, uh, spits out um, a lot of DNA sequence data, which is ready to be analyzed. We analyze that um, usually on, um, we need quite some computing power, so we analyze that on high performance computing cluster. And at some point at the end of the process, we hopefully have a, have a data set that is free of contamination and, uh, and other issues. And we can uh, make some colorful plots and hopefully draw conclusions about human history and evolutions, evolution. So in this particular project, we, um, we started initially with 14 different individuals, which we, as a first step, screened for DNA preservation. So we screened uh, the DNA extract for how much actual human DNA do we find in that? And after the screening, uh, after the screening round, two individuals passed our quality criteria, which actually at that point made us quite happy, because uh, considering uh, considering the region and considering the um, climatic and env environmental conditions there, we did not expect uh, to get a lot of DNA from our samples. But then, kind of as an additional checkpoint or it is an addition to generate additional um, information about these uh, samples that we um, that we were about to study. We also performed radiocarbon dating and it turned out those individuals were much younger than the, uh, than the Neolithic. They were actually from historic ty uh, times, so only uh, around 1,300 years old, uh, which at that point left us a bit both confused and frustrated because we thought we would be doing um, a study on the early Neolithic, on the first farmers of the um, of the region, um, and now we're suddenly in um, in a much younger time period, um, which might explain the DNA preservation, um, but it's definitely not the time that we originally wanted to, wanted to study, and it also took us a bit from our comfort zone, which, um, as I said, origin originally both the archaeologists and the geneticists involved in this project were mostly studying prehistory, 
and it suddenly took us into uh, historical times. Uh, so at that point, we actually invited more people into the project. We invited um, historians and also re-evaluated what we were actually looking at. So if you um, look at the burials of the two individuals that we have genetic data from, from a historical perspective, uh, then there are a couple of things that um, that turned out to be quite interesting. So if you look at the um, position of the of the variant here on the right hand side, you see um, you see one of the two individuals that we have genetic data from. Uh, you see in this case the north is to the right, and that means south is left, and um, which means this individual he is actually looking towards Mecca, and um, this time period this time period. Um, that we're talking about is actually the first uh, century of um, of Islam. Um, so these individuals could uh, um, are actually consistent with being one of the very early Islamic burials, especially in the Levant, um, which was a later expansion of the of the Islam. Um, but so far, there are actually no archaeological studies on such kind of bur burials in that region. Which is because, uh, which is since they are usually on Muslim cemeteries, and then you have obviously uh, limitations on how much you can can do studies on uh, religious sites, um, do excavations, or even um, even do sampling of the bones and DNA extractions. So we kind of by accident stumbled over these early Islamic burials on top of a Neolithic site, which. Kind of makes you wonder why are they buried there so one possibility that we discussed was that there might be a connection to a nomadic lifestyle so that these individuals were just too far away from um uh from a proper cemetery and just had to be buried at that point in time because remember that in um, in islam you actually need to bury the dead uh, quite quickly after they died uh, a second possibility that we discussed was um, could this be plague victims? So again, people that died quite quickly or quite surprisingly of um, of a certain a certain disease. What we what could also be a possibility is that the Neolithic site that these individuals were found on um, might have actually had some significance to um, to these people. So. Um, we now suddenly had a lot more information on these in, on these individuals, which made our later genetic analysis actually much more interesting and in how we can connect it to these um, to the historical processes that um, that were known for this time period. Um, in total, we generated this uh, we generated some genomic data for these two individuals, um, our individuals number five and thirteen. Um, for those who are interested in these numbers here, we have them in, in the table. One of them is male, one of them is female. And uh, the uniparental mar uh, markers, so the mitochondrial haplogroup and the Y haplogroup um, are all very, very much consistent with what you would find in the region today um, and the Middle East in, in general, in both ancient and modern samples. We continued comparing them with um, uh, with modern Middle Eastern pop populations for which we had genomic data available. Um, I'm just realizing that I might have to apologize for the resolution on this uh, principal component analysis because I already have problems seeing it on my screen. So probably not much better for, uh, for the audience. But um, what I want to point out here is that the, that the two triangles are our two individuals that we have sequenced. And um, and on this plot, the um, the slightly faded other symbols in, in the background are different modern Middle Eastern populations. And in this case, um, what actually turned out is that they um, are closest or fall closest on this plot to modern day Saudi, to um, um, to Jew the Jewish population from Yemen, and to um, to a population called uh, Bedouin B. So uh, there's a Bedouin Bedouins A and Bedouins B in the state in this data set both sampled from um, from modern day Israel. Um, so you will see that actually two of these three groups are not from the Levant, uh, but are rather from the uh, Arabian Peninsula. Um, so these two individuals actually se seemed in this analysis quite different from, um, from individuals from the same region today, except for this one Bedouin group. And that kind of uh, result was is consistent throughout a couple of different analyses that we did. So here I'm showing um, an outgroup F3 statistics for our individuals, again, compared with different modern groups. Um, and 
again, we see that the two top on this list are Saudi and, um, and Bedouin B. So again, the same groups and um, that's, that result was consistent throughout a couple of other analyses that we, uh, that we conducted. What we also saw is that these individuals seem to have a relatively low genetic diversity. So here, um, I hope you can, can read it. You can, we compared it to, um, to a couple of modern uh, Middle Eastern populations again. Um, and you see that, um, that, our, um, that our late antiquity Syrians are actually on the lower end of this, uh, this distribution. At this point, uh, we are not able to say whether that's um, because these two individuals were likely relatives, um, because this was calculated using the pairwise distance between those two individuals. So we don't know whether it's because they are relatives or because they um, are general, generally from a group um, with a lot of inbreeding. And so that's definitely something that we um, might find out later on. Uh, the data also allowed us to model their ancestry as um, as a result of um, four ancestral group in this uh, ancestral groups in this case uh, using a software called QPADM. So we used four different sources: um, Neolithic populations from the Levant, Neolithic populations from um, from the Iran, then WHD. Those are Western hunter gatherers um, or European hunter gatherers for this this purpose and um, the Mota individual from Ethiopia, which you just heard about in the previous presentation. And what you can see here is that um, all of these different, different groups from the Arabian Peninsula and the Levant are very similar when it comes to these um, ancestry proportions. Maybe the most striking differences, the difference between them is the um, uh, different degrees of, um, of East African ancestry. So here in these, um, group uh, from Yemen, we actually see a relatively high proportion, whereas in, um, notably in our uh, late antiquity Syrians and um, individuals from Cyprus, we see very low proportions of this East African ancestry. But overall, it, seem, it seems like they are from, with regard to these ancestral groups, are, all of these individuals are, or all of these groups are relatively similar to each other, drawing ancestry from different, uh, different source populations. Um, but what do you, what, as we've seen, we have seen before, there seems to be um, a certain similarity of these, these Syrian individuals to um, to the Saudi. You know, the Saudi group has a bit more African ancestry. The same, the Gemini Jews also has a bit more African ancestry in this case. And the Bedouins B are here also again a bit more African ancestry, but still highly similar to our Syrians. Um, what we also looked into was um, lactase persistence, and um, especially the, the similarity to um, to Bedouins prompted us at doing that. Um, you might know that Bedou Bedouins are um, herders of different uh, different groups, among them camel. And if we look at the if we look at the worldwide distribution of um, lactase persistence, so the ability to digest milk sugar in adulthood. Uh, you see that the Arabian Peninsula is actually one of the biggest centers uh, centers of that. And um, there is also a certain variant, a certain mutation causing this, uh, this phenotype, which is sometimes termed the Arabian lactase persistent variant. And it turns out that we actually find that in, um, that in one of our two individuals. Um, in about half the sequencing reads covering the sites, we see the derived variant for this um, um, for lactase persistence, so this individual was actually able to digest milk sugar in um, as an adult. For the other individual, we cannot answer that question because we didn't have um, have any data covering uh, those sites. But finding this um, this derived mutation at all in one of these individuals actually represents the earliest observation of this variant so far. So even though our individuals are not um, not that old compared to a lot of the ancient material that has been sequenced so far. Uh, we do see that this is a relatively, or this is so far at least uh, the earliest observation of this variant. And that um, might open some interesting possibilities. For example, as I said, since Bedouins also were like a, were um, um, partly camel herding, this might connect these individuals or at least their ancestors to the spread of camel herding um, um, around the region um, as a relatively recent, uh, relatively recent process. Um, what we also wanted to look into 
um, is the possibility of finding any evidence for, um, for an infection in these individuals. And um, you might know that there have been uh, quite a couple of studies finding different pathogen DNA in, um, in ancient uh, human material, um, which led us to quite some understanding of different uh, past pandemics and, um, and also just the evolutionary history of those pathogens. So the idea here, here was that, um, for example, um, a plague outbreak actually happened, uh, took place in modern day Syria in around the time those individuals died. Um, but the specific challenge at this point, point was actually um, the type of material that we, were, that we were working with. So you can only, you can only find the DNA of what's actually there and um, our, remain in this case was a petrous bone, which is usually great for preservation of human DNA, but not ideal for pathogen analysis because um, there's just not, a, not as much blood flow through it as for example, uh, through teeth, um, usually not leaving, uh, not leaving a lot of DNA of uh, potential pathogens. So um, yeah, we still, we still wanted to try it um, to see if we find something. And um, I have to say, this is still very much work in progress. So we don't have um, conclusive results yet. Um, but what I can say from the preliminary results is that we so far have no clear indication of Yersinia pestis, so the uh, plague pathogens. But there are some indications of different um, other pathogens, opportunistic pathogens in one of our individuals. Um, it is with the limited amount of data that we have, it is a bit difficult to authenticate uh, that data um, because we don't see an as clear pattern mm -hmm. as we would like to see. Um, and we also need to add the, um, the caveat that uh, these bacteria or close relatives of these bacteria um, also occur generally as soil bacteria, which um, might also mean that we find their DNA in our um, DNA extracts. Um, but with that, I want to come um, come to the end of my presentation, and um, I think we have a couple of uh, of conclusions that come directly from the um, um, or that are relatively clear. So we have two individuals that uh, were buried on top of a Neolithic site, much later in historical times, around 700 year uh, around 700 AD. Uh, they do show um, genetic similarities to actually only one of the groups that, um, that we have genomic data from in that region, which are the group called Bedouin B in this data set, um, but no, none of the other neighboring groups. Um, instead, they show similarities to other um, to groups uh, today living on the Arabian Peninsula, which um, kind of again also highlights the need for um, uh, good reference data um, data to fully sample the um, the genetic diversity of these regions, especially these regions which um, were kind of crossroads of migration in um, um, throughout human history and human evolution, uh, where we have various different groups still living to uh, living today. Some some of them somewhat is isolated at different um, diff drawing different types of ancestries from different regions, and also what we need we would have like to have more ancient reference data in this case, because we um, we need to use modern populations as a proxy here, for example, for um, ancient uh, populations on the Arabian Peninsula that were potentially involved in, um, in the migrations that might be connected to these individuals. Since we find these individuals to be closely related to, um, to Arab populations from the um, Arabian Peninsula, um, they might be connected to the um, to the historical processes of the first Muslim expansion from the Arabian Peninsula into the Levant, um, and the, uh, and maybe also um, somehow the spread of camel herding, as um, is a bit suggested um, by the presence of the lactase persistent var persistent variant. Um, and then we also have some parts that are consistent with our data, but that might certainly not um, represent the only um, possible explanations of what we see. Um, and that is that this might actually be one of the earliest, at least earliest described uh, Islamic burial in, in this region, um, which we again kind of found by accident uh, or kind of studied by accident because we thought it was something else. And there's the potential that actually a complex infection with uh, various different pathogens was the, um, was the cause of death for at least one of these individuals. 
And with that, I want to end my talk um, and I need to thank a couple of, of people. So first, I want to thank the two um, other main authors, um, co-senior author uh, Chris and um, my former master student, Mega, who was doing most of the genomic analysis and who, by the way, is, um, is currently looking for a place at the grad school. Um, and then we have a couple of other um, uh, collaborators from various different disciplines funding agencies, and um, we have posted um, a previous version of, uh, of these results uh, on BioArchive a while ago. I actually also need to thank um, a lot of the people who have sent us uh, feedback to that. And um, yeah, so I'm also looking forward to receive any comments after this presentation. I, thanks, thanks again for having me and uh, thanks again for your, uh, for your attention. Thank you so much, Torsten. Um, last but not the least, uh, we have uh, Dr. Melinda Young from University of Richmond, uh, and she will talk about the genomics and population history of East Asia. Welcome, Melinda. Oops. Um, yes. Sorry, give me a sec. Let me just get my presentation up. All right. Um, cool. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me and for staying all the way to the last talk on this panel. I'd like to thank AAPA, particularly Xi Jinping, for inviting us to uh, speak with you today about all the many different regions. And, and so I'm here to talk particularly on using large-scale genomic analyses in East Asia. What I forgot to put in my title was what it was a very important part was using ancient DNA. And then so Torsten did do a very good job of introducing my section, and I appreciate that. Okay, so I wanted to break down a little bit about what are large-scale uh, ancient human genomic analyses. And, and so there's sort of three major parts that I'll be breaking down of, we have ancient DNA that we're concerned with, we have many individuals that we're thinking about, and we have many SNPs, and we use that to understand the demographic history within a region. So focusing on ancient DNA, we've seen some talks today that was on fresh DNA or present day human DNA. And then we've seen one talk before mine on ancient DNA. And then so with ancient DNA, you have really short fragments. You have microbial DNA that gets into the mess of samples. You have the problem of human contamination and you can have DNA damage due to many years of it not being maintained. And then so a question becomes, why do we even focus on ancient DNA in the first place? Why do we go to so much effort with all these problems? And then the two main reasons that I present here is that you have access to genetic variation that's not present today. So if you have things that were in the past that you don't see today, you can't sample that if you're just looking at present day populations. Second is if you're interested in archeological samples, you have a direct association with past geography and culture. And so that allows you to directly assess those human groups that you were sampling in the past. Okay, the other aspect is large scale. So the key idea over here is many different individuals. And so this is um, a review paper from 2017, just highlighting the many different regions where they've sampled ancient DNA from different individuals. And just a little bit of an update since then, this is just four papers since 2017, but there's been many more that are highlighting more individuals that have been sequenced across many different regions. And, and so there's a huge, amount of genomic data that's being produced from ancient individuals that need to be analyzed. And all of these often come with different levels of archeological, geographical, and chronological information that can also be included. All right, and then the last thing of the large scale analysis is that we have many SNPs. And, and so the idea here is that we're focused particularly on nuclear DNA. And what that means is that it's inherited from all of our ancestors. And so in contrast to other types of DNA that we might have, this DNA, if you have it from a lot of different regions across your nuclear DNA, then you actually have from one individual a fairly representative history of the populations that they came from in the past. And, and so here we focus on having many different positions across the nuclear genome that we focus on. And so here you can just see a schematic where if you have four different chromosomes, here are places across these chromosomes where you have different mutations across different individuals. And then we're focused in particular on capturing these regions where there are these mutations. And we call them SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. In particular for ancient humans, there's been a focus on this 1240K panel, which consists of about 1.2 million SNPs. And then so these are, um, it's really nice that we have this panel because it has been consensus on this and thus for 
basically every ancient individual study that there, ancient study that there is on DNA, we've used that same panel. And then so when you want to compare for something where there's not much DNA in general, you at least have the same set of SNPs to compare across. However, these are often pseudo haploid, which means that while we usually have two alleles, one from each parent, we just choose one allele at random for each SNP that we're studying because that allows us to be, um, that allows us to be, um, of to deal with the fact that we have very small amounts of data. And then finally, this panel is really well studied and it's widely usable across human populations and there's not much bias within the study. So that allows us to sort of do good demographic inference. So with that, we're gonna be thinking about ancient DNA across many individuals for many different SNPs in the nuclear genome. And our particular region of interest is in Eastern Asia, where um, this paper is published already, and it is um, focused on 24 individuals from East Asia, primarily um, Northern and Southern China, um, and the individuals date to 9,500 to 300 years ago. And, and so this work is something that I did while I was working as a postdoc in Professor Chao Mei Fu's lab in Beijing at the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology. Okay. So to get into that, we have to sort of understand what we know about East Asians. And here I've summed up the four things I think are most important to get at what we've learned using this large scale genomic analysis. The first thing is that we already knew that East Asian ancestry is really widespread today. So using a mix of present day and ancient data from around Asia, it's been found that this gray region over here is representative of samples where they find predominantly East Asian ancestry today. Second, within East Asian ancestry, there's three major clines. So this is a principal components analysis. We'll see another one later. Um, but the idea here is that it separates out genetic variation of interest. In, in East Asia over here, we find that there's a Southern cline, a Northern cline, and a Tibetan or Western cline over here. Okay, um, archeologically speaking in East Asia, during the period dating to 9,500 years ago, we actually have a really interesting period archeologically speaking because we have the development of farming within this region. And then so we have the origin of millet farming in the Northern regions and of rice farming within the Southern regions. And then prior to this, it was all um, hunter gathering societies. And then the last thing I wanted to bring our mind to is the fact that there's been interesting hypotheses about how humans have migrated into Asia. And then so there's a two layer hypothesis shown over here where there's initially a first layer within Asia. And then those farming communities that came down into East Asia primarily came from a Northern expansion southward. And then so we're interested in all of these different ideas. Okay, so all of this stuff is focused um, that, that I brought up over here in these four are focused on present day DNA or ancient DNA from many different regions around here or archeological data without the connection of genetic data. And then so what we wanted is, can we connect this to ancient DNA? And so I'm not gonna get in detail into the workflow over here, but just from Torsten's uh, talk, we see that we have Tetris bones that we focused on to get the best DNA samples from. And then we went through an ancient DNA workflow to be able to capture those 1240K SNPs. We checked for various levels of contamination and things like that. And then my job was primarily doing the population genetic analysis. So I was doing that final step over there. So these are two examples of some of the bones that we were looking at. And so if we get to these 24 individuals, we see that we have them on different time scales over here and different geographic regions. So we have in Northern East Asia, these dating to the early Neolithic. And in Southern East Asia, we have dating from the early Neolithic to the historic period. And then so we, with this, we're like, we can actually get at what is the East Asian genetic history? How well does it reflect those four patterns that we discussed earlier? And so this is just a quick, if anyone's interested, a more detailed rundown of data. The main thing I wanna focus on is we had a very low contamination rate. Um, and those we did have higher contamination rates, we used methods to only retain things that we were pretty sure was ancient DNA. And then we also had more than 300,000 SNPs for every single individual um, site that we were looking at, which allowed us to be fairly confident in our results. Okay, so our first question was, are our newly sampled individuals early Asian or East Asian? Are we actually talking about East Asian ancestry? And just to get at that idea, there's been other samples that have been sampled in Asia that have shown that there's these other types of Asian ancestry that you don't see very well represented in East Asians today. And in that 
ties into that two layer hypothesis where we have this first layer of early Asians. So we have the Tanyuan, Horbinians in Southeast Asia and Jomon in Japan, and then all present day East Asians and other ancient East Asians that were sampled more recently are of a similar ancestry that's unrelated to those three. Um, there's been morphological studies that have been done that suggest that this two layer hypothesis does play uh, a large role within Asia. And if we look here, the purple over here is largely representing those recent East Asians, and the red over here is largely representing those early Asians. And then so we were interested in how our newly sampled individuals can fit within this phylogeny. And then so we have some individuals from sites that are in this purple region, and if so, then we would imagine they would be more closely related to recent East Asians. Um, however, we also had samples over here that were in this red region, and, and so that suggested they would be more related to these early Asians. And, and so therefore, we were like, perhaps we can get you know, all the diversity within the early Neolithic period. However, when we did this um, analysis here, we did a tree mix analysis. So we looked at a phylogeny connecting our ancient individuals. And so those are the ones highlighted in blue and green over here. And we compared them to various recent ancient East Asians, as well as early Asians. And so if we compare and take a closer look over here, in red I have in branches those that are leading to early Asians, and then in purple I have the branches leading to recent East Asians. And then what we find is all of our ancient individuals over here um, in these represented by these blue stars over here are connected to this purple lines, which suggests that they are of recent East Asian ancestry. And I want to say that this also includes those that looked more early Asian-like in their cranial morphology. And then so that um, was suggesting that we over here are having something really interesting when we're capturing recent East Asian ancestry. We found similar conclusions using under analytical tools as well as using present-day East Asians, so we were more confident in these results. So with that then, we can start saying, how can we dive into this region and think a little bit more about the diversity within East Asia. And so here I highlight those ancient recent East Asians that we have, as well as present day East Asians that we wanted to compare against as well. And then so here I return to a principal component analysis. And then so this is basically an analysis where we're reducing the number of dimensions that we're looking at. So there's a lot of different things that can lead to different genetic patterns. And here we're sort of collapsing them into those important dimensions to explore um, the diversity within East Asia. And then so here, this one doesn't have any of our uh, new ancient data, but it sort of shows where things sit um, for present day and ancient East Asians that were previously studied. So in gray shows all of the present day East Asians and the names here are um, based off of their language groups. And then in red, I highlight where these ancient individuals that were previously studied that I described that have East Asian ancestry and where they fall. So we have Siberians on a Northern East Asian cline, Southern East Asians on a Southern cline, ancient Tibetans on a Tibetan cline. So it all you know, sort of makes sense over here. And then so the question is, where do our ancient East Asians fall? And um, so one thing I wanted to highlight over here, since we want to talk a little bit more about assumptions, is that this were ancient individuals projected onto present-day East Asians. So it's based on genetic vari variation found today. And then so there can be some different interpretations of data, and there's a good survey, but there's no direct comparison. So looking just at this, you can't really get a demographic model, but it's a nice summary of what's going on. One example is you can see the early Asians here who are outside of present-day East Asian diversity, and they are located over here, and it's really hard to be able to come to that conclusion just looking at a PCA. Okay, but to our data, which is fully within East Asian diversity, here we can start getting at the questions of what's going on. So first, I wanna focus on this individual um, from Inner Mongolia, or Yu Ming, and we find that he, um, she, sorry, um, is found in this area between the Tibetan and Northern East Asian cline, and groups a little bit more with these Northern um, ancient individuals that have been sampled. Second, we have individuals here at the lower reaches of the Yellow River in the Shandong Plain, um, and they cluster over here tightly at the base of the Northern cline, um, leading to Northern East Asians. Lastly, we have for our Southern East Asians, all clustering particularly right over here at the base of the Austronesian cline. And so we're starting to see separation here between a Northern and the Southern groups based off of their genetics that corresponds with their geography. So we next wanted to ask, how do we sort of assess these patterns and how they changed over time? And then so first, um, we wanted to look at this method called this F4 statistic, which is a test of relative shared alleles. 
The benefits are that you can set up a very simple statistic with just a few populations and comparing them to each other and sort of get a sense of affinities that they have to each other. The disadvantage is that you only have four populations that you put in. So you really want to understand how they relate to each other. And so we have an outgroup population over here, Central African and Booty. And if it wasn't actually a good outgroup, then this would, you know, be a, a, a analysis that would be difficult to interpret. Um, and then we set it up carefully so that we had all of our ancient individuals placed in this position. And then we asked how it was related to our oldest Southern East Asian and our oldest Northern East Asian. And if our statistic was significantly positive, then we set it up in a way such that those individuals are more closely related to our Northern East Asian, or that's the signal that we found. If it's significantly less than zero, then our individuals were more related to our Southern East Asian. And so if we look, I've already let the data sort of sit here so you can sort of absorb what's happening here. In green, we have significantly positive results, and in blue, we have significantly negative results. And, and so uh, in the early Neolithic and the late Neolithic, we primarily find that if you sort of divide East Asia in half along this line, those in the north are most closely related to this oldest northern East Asian, and those in the south are most closely related to our oldest southern East Asian. However, when we get to present day East Asia, we find that there's a difference um, in the pattern where those in southern East Asia, as well as those in northern East Asia, have and affiliation with those Northern East Asians. And so that was a really big and striking sort of pattern that we observed that by the present day, all East Asians show Northern affinities. And so this is just quickly to sh show you that the results can be a little bit more complicated. So that was just a measure of affinity. Here, we're looking at mixture proportion estimates using the same analysis QP Adam that Torsten described. And so when we looked up um, mixture proportions, we have five different um, sources of ancestry that we explored. And then what we want to focus on over here is in present day East Asia, we see that the Southern East Asian ancestry isn't gone, it's there in mixed proportions. And then so um, that it actually is a mix of Northern and Southern East Asian ancestry that's found across all of this region. And then so just to end on this note, what we found is that populations in Northern and Southern East Asia um, already show similar ancestry to each other in the early Neolithic, like that found in present-day East Asian. So by 9,500 years ago, in this region, we're finding that East Asian ancestry that we see today. However, that East Asian ancestry is not as mixed as it is today, as it, um, it was back then in the past, and we found that there's higher genetic differentiation between North and South um, in the past compared to today, which suggests that there was recent mixture um, in this region. And there's a higher affinity to northern ancestry, which suggests that there was some migration southwards from the north. And then the last thing was the thing I touched upon, which is these southern ancestries over here um, actually have a large, uh, they're at the base of the Austronesian cline, and they have a lot of connections to Austronesians, which shows that Austronesians likely came from the mainland roughly around that region. Okay. So that's uh, everything I wanted to say in my 15 minutes or so. And so if you have any questions, feel free to ask me now or email me at my email at a later point. If you want um, to see an article that's sort of overviewing East Asian ancestry, um, there's one that's published at that link. And then lastly, I'd wanna thank everybody that was part of this uh, paper, this project. Um, there are so many people that are involved and I was really just doing that last part of connecting all the final dots with the computational analyses. And, and so thank you to all of you for listening and to the AAPA for having us. Thank you so much, Melinda, for the uh, great talk. Um, so, um, Brett, are we doing the video for now? Yes, we're gonna do a short one minute video that thanks our, it's from our sponsor today, the Royal Society Publishing. And then we do have a few questions and we'll take those uh, right after the video. So here we go. Let me try, let me try to prompt the video again. Um, it's not, I can't get it to work. I'm gonna to try to prompt the video one more time. Let's see if we can get it to go here.
Okay, sorry, uh, we can't get the video to go, uh, but that's okay. We'll jump over to the questions. Let's uh, let's get everybody to come back on um, camera and mic if you can. Great. Um, the first question is an anonymous question. It says, and this was uh, asked during the first presentation. So it says, how is the possibility of multiple admixture events at different times accounted for? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And obviously, like a model of instantaneous admixture where you just have one admixture event is not accurate for Cabo Verde's admixture scenario. Um, so a lot of the methods that we use do account for multiple admixture events over time. Though we know things like alder behave the best when there's just instantaneous admixture. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to bring in a few different methods that incorporate different scenarios. Multi-waiver can allow for multiple waves of admixture, but doesn't allow for non-random mating. Uh, the LAD-based method that we saw incorporates both the non-random mating and you can change the admixture rate over time. So we tried it both with instantaneous admixture and with constant admixture. And constant admixture reflected the historical estimates more accurately. So there's, you definitely have to account for beyond just instantaneous admixture to get results that accurately reflect the population history. Great. Uh, thank you. So the next question is from Hiba Babaker. It says, do the Nuba peoples refer to the Nuba mountain populations in Sudan? Um, so the Nuba peoples are from, uh, so that data is from a previous publication. So I am not sure um, what specifically they refer to, but I do believe they are from Sudan. So that is possible. I'll try to find the uh, the citation for that um, publication. Great. Um, okay, the next question is from Barry Bogan. It says, for several decades, more Cape Verdeans are living outside of the islands in Portugal, the USA, and elsewhere than inside the islands. How might this outmigration with admixture with non-Cape uh, Verdean partners and back migration for family visits and possible leaving of DNA back on the islands influence the estimates of ancestry shown in the talk today? Uh, that, that's a really interesting question. And I think that's, that's one of the reasons we need to have these models that incorporate admixture over time and not just instantaneous admixture. But we obviously in our estimates weren't accounting for everything going on in the population, even when we included non-random mating and continuous admixture, our estimates didn't fully overlap or in, in some islands didn't recapitulate the historical estimates. And it might be in part due to things like that, people, people migrating to the islands from different groups recently or living outside of the islands and then returning. Uh, that certainly happens. And we see some individuals with long intact haplotypes from the different source populations. So I think that there are certainly very recent migrate, migrants in the island. Okay. Um, next question is from Yi Lei Huang. It says, hi, I'm wondering, do you know what is causing the sharp decrease in NE in the most recent several generations for many of the populations you show here? And that's for you, Shimalika. Um, sure. So, uh... The decline in NE in hunter-gatherer populations is largely thought to be associated with them um, being displaced or, yeah, just being um, not able to live in the regions uh, that they lived in before and uh, they, their ranges decreasing and, and um, with their population size uh, decreasing along with that. Um, so that is the main, I guess, hypothesis for why the population sizes are decreasing. So um, if they don't uh, admix with um, the incoming agriculturalist or pastoralist populations, their ancestry is just going to be restricted to a smaller geographic space and, and their their actual population size will also decline. Great. Uh, the next question is from Kathleen Hauser. It says, 
Will anthropological genetics always focus on, or focus analyses on region-specific samples? Is this the future as well as the past? Note that I am not dissing on region-specific analyses, just asking. I think that one that might be for anybody. <laughs> um, I guess I'll, I'll jump in in that I don't think it will be region-specific forever. I think that there, um, there's a question right now of regions that don't have data and so you want to sort of start filling in gaps right and so that's where it is that you start but as there becomes more and more data across different regions I think it becomes easier to then do these sort of cross comparative analyses that are at a wider scale and I think you saw that with just present day human data in terms of other types of studies that have been done and then at least for me I see that more and more with ancient DNA. Great. Um... The next one is from Pearl Gorino Vignon. It says, question for T uh, for uh, for Gunther, Dr. Gunther. Uh, did they try to perform DSTAT or F4 stat to test for the affinity with recent day population of your two individuals regarding the others? Um, yes, we actually tried that. I didn't um, include it in the presentation, but it, it turns out that um, that our two Syrian individu in, individual uh, individuals form clades with um, with the ones that we mentioned to the exclusion of all other Middle Eastern modern populations. Uh, but if we test, if we test, okay, let me get this straight. If we test the three populations, our Syrians, um, the Saudi modern day Saudi and uh, modern day Bedouin speed, then our Syrians actually are an outgroup to um, to those to the Bedouins and the Saudi. Um, this next one is from Jacob Gardner. It says, <laughs> it comes with a compliment too. It says, question for Melinda. Great talk, Mel. Big fan of your work. In your opinion, what is currently the biggest gap in our understanding of East Asian population history? Uh -huh. um, I also know you, Jacob, so thank you for, for the shout out. Um, I would say that one of the things that I didn't really dive into in terms of like where the the things that I did was going in was that a lot of my samples were focused on the coast in coastal East Asia and a lot of it I didn't talk as much about archaeology because we didn't have many samples there that were focused on people that we have been very well studied in East Asia who are really tied to the early farming communities we just they're in the sort of suggested regions and so I think as you move more inland into the Yellow River region into the Yangtze River region in northern and southern China, which are like the true, you know, origins of farming according to archaeological studies, you're going to start seeing a lot of interesting interplay of what was going on over there. So that, and then also I'm going to plug the like pre-10,000 years ago hunter-gatherers of East Asia and what did that look like? Nothing we have except for one 40,000-year-old individual um, is older than this 9,500-year-old individual that we have. So that that's going to be really interesting for the extent of genetic diversity that used to be in East Asia. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, Jill, who's one of my co-organizers here, can you take a look at the chat? And I think um, I think there's a link there that we can put out to everybody. Um, uh, yes, yeah, sorry. That was, uh, I didn't realize that was just going to us, but. Um, yeah, no, that's okay. Question. Sure, uh, I can send that to everybody. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Um, I just wanted to say that, yeah, that, that was from Hiba's paper, that uh, yeah. population. Excellent. Okay, uh, next question. We have uh, three more. Uh, this one is from Maria Avila Arcos. It says, hi, great talks. For the research projects concerning present day populations, do the results conflict with their own knowledge of their past? And how do you communicate the results to them? <laughs> um, I guess that's for me as well. So uh, the findings that we happen to um, find do match up with the, uh, at least with the Chabus um, and with the Majang and the Shikachos, uh, traditional knowledge and understanding of where they came from. Um, the Majang and the Shikacho, for example, do uh, recognize that the Chabu are the original people of that forest, um, and we have returned the results to them. So um, many of the uh, results that I presented today have already been re returned to the Chabu and to the neighboring populations um, in subsequent field trips. Okay. 
Uh, the next question is from Hiba Babaker, and it says, question to Torsten. I would like to ask if the Muslim burial sites from approximately 700 AD remain unchanged, or maybe what if non-Muslim burial sites impacted by site changes get studied as Muslim sites? Um, I, I have, thanks Hiba for that question. And um, you may have noticed in, in my presentation that we are not, we ourselves are not entirely sure that this is a Muslim site. It was kind of a, um, a second-hand interpretation after we got the radiocarbon dates and only looking at the, at the photographs. So there's certainly a lot of other possible um, interpretations uh, to that. And um, let's say for for like writing the paper, we're actually um, struggling with finding the right tone on, on, on that uh, because we know that there are various possibilities. We think this is the uh, most likely one, um, but um, but yeah, we can't prove it. So um, we know that we need to be careful about that and about other possibilities. Thank you. Uh, and the last question we have is for Catherine and it's from Lauren Clark. It says, Catherine, what is the significance of 150 centimorgans you use in the identity by descent you refer to in your plot? Is 150 centimorgans the standard metric of genetic distance? I will say that is an arbitrary cutoff, and we've played with a lot of different cutoffs. And in our preprint, which we hope to post very soon, we'll have that as a main figure and then a supplementary set of figures with different cutoffs. So you get to see the whole picture of IBD sharing. We just wanted to zoom in at the more related individuals. And so we set off a set a cutoff to achieve that so that we could see what was going on and not just have an edge for every little bit of IBD sharing, especially because it's this island population where you have a lot more relatedness than, than you might otherwise. Great, um, that's it for questions. And thank you guys for doing such a great job and for, uh, and for sticking in there that the, uh, for the questions at the end, this is great. And um, Sinjun, did you wanna say anything to wrap up? Uh, yes. Uh, can I share my screen again? Yes, absolutely. Hang on a second here. Okay, it should be prompting you now. Okay, great. Um, so uh, thank you everyone again for uh, for joining us today, and thank you for our guest speakers for sharing your fantastic science. This is really exciting, and thanks for all of the audience for staying with us today. So before we leave, I'd like to thank again for AAPA, uh, our sponsor, Royal Society Publishing, and also the Burke Association for uh, helping us uh, get this together. So our next webinar will be a AJPA workshop on how to peer review journals and how to get a, a potential list of uh, uh, reviewers, which sounds very exciting. So please follow the AAPA website. Uh, there's a link down here um, uh, regarding the specific time and date and also how to register. Um, and last but not least, uh, our annual meeting will be next year in April. Um, so the registration is currently open. Um, so if you haven't uh, registered uh, or if you haven't joined AAPA yet, but you're interested in, uh, will be uh, looks like will be mostly virtual and hopefully we'll have a small uh, in-person um, uh, component, depending on the uh, um, situation next year. So I hope to see everybody um, there uh, and also in our future webinars. Um, so once again, thank you all for joining us and I hope all of you have a safe and great holiday season. Thank you everybody, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.